it would be my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce our Worshipful Master for Burlingame Lodge number 400 uh, in Burlingame, California, in the beautiful Burlingame down, downtown area, uh, Worshipful Roberto Diaz Jr. Um, he's actually a past master from last year and still current sitting master. Worshipful Roberto, would you take the floor? Good evening, brethren, and welcome to all, uh, especially to Burlingame uh, number 400, Masonic guest speaker presentation. After a brief hiatus, uh, we return with our, again, ninth speaker presentation. My name is Roberto Diaz Jr. I am the repeating Worshipful Master of Berlin Lodge number 400 in Burlingame, California. On behalf of our lodge, I would like to offer a great big fraternal welcome to all. We're very pleased to have you here again with us. Uh, before we start, I would like to uh, acknowledge in our virtual audience, uh, we have, uh, I believe, an inspector, and definitely we have uh, Worshipful Gary Quintrell, our uh, uh, assistant grand lecturer for Division I. Uh, welcome, Brother Gary. Um, before we start, Brother Aiden Cotter, our chaplain, will uh, lead us in prayer. Brother Aiden. Let us assume an attitude of prayer. Great architect of the universe. In thy name we have assembled, and in thy name we desire to proceed in all our doings. Grant that the sublime principles of Freemasonry may so subdue every discordant passion within us, so harmonize and enrich with thine own love and goodness, that the Lodge at this time may humbly reflect that order and beauty which reign forever before thy throne. Amen. Brethren, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the FAG of our country, and uh, please remain silent, and we're going to have our senior warden, Brother Dennis Silva, will lead us in the pledge. Brother Dennis? Brethren, please repeat with me the Pledge of Allegiance of our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Brother Dennis. Um, helping us tonight in our virtual format, we have, uh, as uh, he was already introduced, I worship with Brother Marty Kusing, and we have Brother Dennis Silva and Brother Aiden Cotter. So without further ado, Brethren, it is with great pleasure and honor to introduce to our lecture series, Most Worshipful Russell E. Charbonia, Past Grandmaster. Uh, Brother Charvonia wanted to keep it simple, and he, he preferred as his bio, just basically simple statement, Russ is a hell of a guy. Um, but to do him justice, I think uh, I need to elaborate a little bit more on that. He is definitely a hell of a guy, uh, and on reading his bio, uh, it needs to be shared. Most worshipful, Charboni is a past grand master of Masons in California, of um, Grand Lodge of Calico. California, most worshipful Russ Charboni is a past master, there we go, of Channel Islands Lodge, number 214 in Ventura. After serving as master in 1996, he served eight years as the lodge treasurer and was presented the Hiram Award in 2002. For the Charboni, service to the Grand Lodge began in 1995 when he was appointed to the Grand Lodge Committee on Finance, which he served for 10 years, including two terms as chairman. He has since served on the Committee on Investments and Audit Committee. In 2006, Russ, uh, Brother Russ was appointed as director of the Knob Hill Masonic Center and served as president. He has also served on the boards of the California Masonic Foundation and Masonic Bones of California. In 2014, he served as the 149th Grand Master of Masons in California. Brother Charboni is a 33rd degree Inspector General Honorary of the Valley of Ventura Scottish Rite Bodies. He's also a York Rite member and a Shrine member. He's a member of the Lodge of the Holy Land, number 50 in Israel, Kona Lodge in Hawaii, and Tanana Lodge, number three in Fairbanks, Alaska. He received the Demolay Honorary Legion of Honor in 2012 and is a certified adult volunteer for all three Masonic youth orders, Demolay, Job's Daughter, and Rainbow for Girls. Brother Charboni has been in the financial service 
industry since 1980. He earned his Juris Doctor degree in 2003 and is a practicing uh, attorney and founder of Channel Islands Law Group where he specializes in estate planning and also has a mediation practice. Um, his greatest passion is to help to restore civility in society using the Masonic values and teaching. He is doing this by leading the Masonic Family Civility Project. Brother Charbonia lives in Ventura with his wife of 25 years, Linda, who's a past honor queen and recipient of the degree of Royal Purple of Bethel 89, Job's International. Very interesting as a side note, most worshipful, uh, Brother Charbonia's father-in-law, most worshipful Harry L. Maynard, served as the 117th Grand Master of Masons in California and Hawaii in 1982. What a, <laughs> what a bio for a hell of a guy. Most worshipful as Charbonia will be presenting this evening, Civility in Society, to restore civility in society using Mas Masonic values and teachings. Most worshipful Russ, the virtual floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Worshipful Roberto. And I realize that I need to update that bio because Linda and I have now been married for 29 years. So <laughs> you know, it's a problem with having an outdated bio. And uh, next time, maybe you'll take my word for it. <laughs> Just he's a heck of a guy and we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> Brethren all, it is indeed a pleasure to get to spend some time with you. Um, looking through the <clears throat> participant list, um, I, I know many of you, of course, and my one regret is that we're not there for that handshake or that big old hug that we all miss so, so very much. And hopefully that time is not far, far from coming. Masonic civility in uncertain times. Um, these are indeed uncertain times, and there are times when the world needs masonry in general and the Masonic values and principles in particular. It seems like our world is, our society is just floundering, um, hopping from one soundbite, one crisis, one chaotic moment to the very next. And if you look at what Freemasonry does is it provides a, a foundation for us, a, a grounding, if you will, in these turbulent times, turbulent stormy seas. So what I hope to, we can accomplish tonight is to um, re-examine what Masonry teaches us and re-examine our own, what we take out of Masonry very personally and make a determination to take what we're learning tonight or relearning more accurately, starting tomorrow to begin to repair our world. Now we have uh, about 25 of us here. We're gonna spend an hour and a half or so together. So if my math is right, that's 35 to 40 hours we're gonna spend together cumulatively. I'm an investment uh, advisor, as, as you heard Worshipful Roberto say, so it's all about return on investment. So let's make sure that we are getting our value for that time spent today. Um, if you throw a, a $30 an hour fee on that, that's $1,000 we're cumulatively investing. Let's make sure we get that $1,000 worth of this out of tonight. So one way I'm going to suggest you do that is as you're listening to me and as we're communicating with one another, I ask that you identify three nuggets, three things that you're going to take from tonight and begin to implement tomorrow be it if you go back to work, be it in your community, your home life, wherever. I wish I could open this up, but I ask you now, you know, why three? Well, first of all, three is a very Masonic number. We like that. But the other thing is, have you ever gone to one of those conferences and you have your notebook and you're just writing furiously and, and at the end of the conference, it was so much good information, but what happens to those notes? They end up in the, in the drawer never to see the light of day again. The human mind can focus on achieving three things at a time. More than that, it just shuts down, doesn't do any of it. So that's the other reason I suggest you search for those three nuggets. So I, I will hope to deliver them to you. Your job is to find them as we progress. You know, I don't need to go in any 
any anecdotes about how uncivil the world about us is. Whether you're driving, whether you're in a shopping center, or a grocery store, whether you're at work, whether you're online and in a, yet another Zoom meeting, it's almost certain that uncertainty is, is that incivility is going to raise its ugly head. It is to the point where we cannot even stand to be in the same room as somebody who has a different opinion from ourselves. And that, my brethren, is potentially the downfall to civility as we know it. And it's something that we have to turn around and turn around as soon as we can. Frankly, if we don't, I'm really concerned that it may not be able to be turned around. I'm afraid that this may become so much a part of our moral fabric, such a habit that we are not able to reverse it. I've had a lot of people tell me over these years that I've been working on this effort that periods of civility and incivility are, are strictly cyclical, kind of like the stock market or the real estate market. And if we wait it out, it will improve. It will return back to normal. To which I have two responses. Number one is what is wrong with us shortening this negative period of incivility? Don't we all want to get to a better time quicker rather than just wait it out? And secondly, my bigger concern is that this may not be able to be reversed. And if it can be, it may take a, a generation or two. You see, our young people in our lives are going to start thinking this is the way they should treat one another. If they witness it in their adults in their lives, they're going to, whether they consciously or subconsciously think about it, they will start to incorporate those same uncivil behaviors. So my brethren, we have to do it all that we can to turn it around and to do that now. The good news is I believe we can. Now we talk so much in masonry about going from darkness to light, but in my mind, that's not far enough. We need to go from darkness to light to true enlightenment. And we can do that using the principles of Freemasonry. If you think about the formation of this country, looking at our Bill of Rights, our Declaration of Independence, our US Constitution, so much of it is filled with Masonic values. And that, of course, is not an accident. It's that way because so many of our founding fathers were, in fact, Masons. And let's face it, Masonry is nothing unique unto itself in terms of brand new ideas. It simply has borrowed from other societies and from religious tenets and so on. But what I think Masonry has done really, really well is pulled those all together into such a neat package that it allows us to become the type of person that we strive to be. So I believe it's up to us to use those Masonic ideals to restore civility to society. So the question I ask of each of you is whether you agree, and if so, is now that time that we should begin to make a difference? And I hope your heads are all nodding. We started this effort back in 2014. And every month since then, a group of us formulating the Masonic uh, Family Civility Project have met. We spent the first four months trying to define the word civility. We thought that was a logical place to start. And we wrote some really cool definitions, both incorporating Masonic ideals and, and not. Nothing was quite, quite grasping it. I, I liken it to trying to hold sand in your hand. You just, you can't do it. And after four months of this futility, I did what I should have done from the outset, which is what? I Googled it. I typed into Wikipedia the word civility. And all of a sudden, it was like an aha moment. When I typed in the word civility, it said C in civility. So as of seven years ago, the word was not defined in Wikipedia, the font of all knowledge. There is no word. And that really sunk into me. No wonder we were having such a tough time trying to define the word. We know what it is not much better than we, we know how to define it. 
By the way, if you Google uh, the word in or look it up in Wikipedia now, you will see a definition. And that definition is, the, is what we entered into it. Thanks uh, primarily to Brandon Lippincott, past master of Conejo Valley Lodge down in Southern California. And if you look and you have my permission to look now, you'll see references to Freemasonry through and through. Uh, we had a whole lot more, but uh, they, they pulled it out, some of it over time. You see, so many people believe that being civil is just a question of applying the rules of etiquette, about being polite to one another, avoiding those difficult conversations. There's another school of thought that thinks it doesn't have anything to do with that. It's all about being able to engage in difficult conversations with somebody with whom you disagree. And I think it's really a combination of the two. I don't think you can have that civil dialogue with somebody if you don't have a basic level of dignity and respect for that person. And I hope that that makes some sense to you. Um, you also don't need civility when things are going well, when relationships are going swimmingly. You need civility to be able to step in when things are difficult. You also can't begin to learn how to be civil when you have a disagreement in the heat of the moment. You have to practice this well before those occasions ever occur. And that's what we're going to try to help you with this evening. I painted a pretty dour picture. The good news is, I believe we can fix it. And why should we do it as Masons? We don't do this in the name of Freemasonry, but we do it simply because it's the right thing to do. And if we don't do it, then I ask you, who will? So that's why I think we have a pivotal part to play in this. Let's start thinking about our three principal tenets and our four cardinal virtues and what they have to say about civility. Brotherly love treating everybody as you would wish to be treated, providing relief, support for that fallen brother, treating one another from a point of truth and not falsehood. That's how we react to, to others. The four principal tenets to me are more inward, that we temper our passions and our reactions, that we deal with difficult situations with fortitude, with perseverance that we are always prudent in how we deal with one another in our relationships and that we treat one another justly and fairly and equitably. If those seven tenets don't speak to civility, I don't know how you can better define it, frankly. Now, many of us are very involved with our youth orders. Um, if you think about D. Malay, they have seven precepts, not unlike ours. And I've had many of these sessions with members of the DMLA order. And I've had them talk about each of these precepts and they can liken every one of them to the word civility. I've done this with Rainbow for Girls and they can liken this, these seven stations of the bow to civility as well, as well as the teachings of Job's daughters. This isn't an accident, brethren. These rituals were written within the Masonic context and by Masons. And while the wording is different, they all come down to one common thread in my mind. And that is how to treat one another, the friend and the stranger with dignity and with respect. When we go out in the, the uh, profane world, if you will, do they need to know that these are Masonic or Demolé or Job's or Rainbow concepts? No. When we talk to somebody about treating them on the level and, and um, acting by the square, these are concepts we can share with them. Again, not in the name of Masonry, but because being a Mason is so much a part of who we are. One of the first things that we were able to do when we started this effort back in 2014 
is working with the National Civility Center, we created a civility toolbox. If you can picture the snap-on or the craftsman tool chest that you may have in your garage, and whether you're working around the house or working on the car, you're gonna open the drawer that has those tools to fulfill that job. And you're gonna pick out the particular tool or tools that you need to do it. Same type of thing with this toolbox. And I encourage you to go to civilitycenter.org under resources, and you'll see thousands upon thousands of tools there. And these are tools that'll help you if you're encountering instability in your workplace, in your school, in your community, in your family life, dare I say, inside your lodge. So I encourage you to explore that and you will find some really, really super resources. I'm gonna share a few of those with you as we move through tonight. Now, one of the things that masonry does better than any other institution, any other society of which I'm aware, is that we bring together brethren, men of very disparate background and thought and opinion and sect. And we bring them together to create and accomplish great good. But masonry is successful because we have the systems in place to bring these different kinds of people together for more common good. In our other walks of life, in society as a whole, I think we all recognize the benefits of, of diversity. But if we simply plop a bunch of people who are different from one another together and say, okay, now go make it work, it's not going to work. You see, diversity to be successful, to be advantageous, takes some intentionality and some effort. So the first thing to making diversity successful is that we need to seek to understand other people. Now, notice I said seek. You can't passively wait for somebody to share with you what's important to them and what makes them tick. We need to be genuinely interested and curious in other people. One of my three careers is that of a financial advisor. I basically get paid to be curious and interested in people. I love learning about their careers. I love learning about their hopes and their dreams and their fears. I love learning about their children and what they hope for them to accomplish. I'm a sponge, basically. I love learning about other people. But I have to be active in doing that, not passive. The next step, once we get to that point, is to accept one another for those differences. Now, if we get to this point, I, I view that as going from darkness to some light, but not true enlightenment. Because accepting one another could stop at just mere tolerance of each other. And I'll, support, I'll suggest to you that that is not true enlightenment. And so we need to get to the next point, which is where we appreciate one another for our differences. Think about meals. If we had to eat a certain type of food every day in and day out, we'd get sick of it in no time. But when we can have French and German and Ethiopian and Mexican and Italian food and so on, that's what makes, helps to make life fulfilling. And it's the same kind of thing with us as individuals. Now in the days of the pandemic, if you're at all like me, you're doing a whole lot more walking around your neighborhood than you've ever done before. I imagine most of you could tell me about every crack in that sidewalk that's coming up because of the tree roots. But imagine for a minute you're walking down the sidewalk and you see a piece of broken glass or a chart of tile or something there. What are you gonna do with it? You're likely either gonna kick it off to the side so no other person or animal gets hurt, or you're gonna pick it up and hang on to it until you find a trash can. Because by itself, it is nothing spectacular. In fact, it could even be dangerous. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that each of us is that broken chart. And by itself, we can only accomplish so much. But when put together by some, you know, in, in a, a grand scheme of things, we can create something unique, something beautiful, something truly special. 
Those of you that have had the privilege of attending our Grand Lodge building on Knob Hill in San Francisco recognize this, of course, is that beautiful endo mosaic designed by Emil Norman. And if you get up close to it, you'll notice it's actually made up of little bits of glass and tile and seeds and leaves and stuff you wouldn't even be noticing on the sidewalk as you're walking over it. So I hope this example of how we can fit together with such exact nicety is not only important, but critical for an effective, safe, productive society. President Jimmy Carter, I think, said it really well. We've become not a melting pot, but a beautiful mosaic. Different people, different beliefs, different yearnings, different hopes, different dreams. Let's give each other the space to have these. It's been a long time since, well, not that long, I guess now, but haven't sat in, in as many lodge meetings as I, I yearn to do. But as I walk into a lodge room, there's obviously a lot of symbolism around us, but there's one particular symbol that I am always looking for. And this isn't required in California lodges, although it is in many other jurisdictions. And it's, of course, that point within the circle. And that point is said to represent us, the individual who's always striving to become a better citizen, a better human, a better husband, a better father, a better employee, just better all the way around. And we have all these pressures coming at us from all angles of society, trying to prevent us from developing into that person. Fortunately, we have masonry that helps us to, to fight off those external pressures. So the first thing we're taught to do is take the compasses and circumscribe a circle around ourselves. And this creates a boundary beyond which we're not to allow our passions and our prejudices to begin to intrude upon the rights and enjoyment of others. Is this telling us not to be passionate? Of course not. Because without passion, nothing worthwhile would get accomplished. But what this says to me is I need to have a constant awareness of how my attitude, how my behavior, how my words are impacting others. If we were there together, I would actually be getting right in somebody's face. And you would watch them recoil because I've just intruded their personal space. Well, we need to be constantly aware of that. Now, I'll admit there may be times where we want to cause that discomfort in somebody, but that needs to be a calculated effort and not an inadvertent one. So one of the first things I encourage you to do is, is create a new awareness of when your behavior, when your words are beginning to impact somebody in a negative way, and then back off. I'll give you an example of this. We, we talk about um, political correctness and snowflakes and all this kind of stuff. Um, and granted, any pendulum can swing too far one way or the other. But in my mind, if a particular group of people or an individual person wishes to be referred to in a certain way or talked to in a certain way, don't we owe that person some basic human dignity and decency to fulfill that to the best of our ability? So if the symbol stopped here, that alone is an incredibly power, powerful illustration for me. But it isn't finished, of course. The next thing we have are these two parallel perpendicular lines, which are said to represent, of course, our patron saints of masonry. And when we see this symbol, it's supposed to conjure up the teachings that they have extolled over the, deck, over the centuries. I'll tell you, when I see those two lines, it also reminds me of my Masonic mentors, the men who have guided me throughout my Masonic career, and frankly, the men who continue to do so. You see, mentorship is, is something that's, that's critical. And again, as Masons, we do this better than almost any other group of people in society. But I think we are oftentimes afraid to mentor people. <laughs> Excuse me. You know, we all joke about the past master once he takes that hat off in the east and sits on the sidelines. He has all the answers. 
And I think that could be having a negative effect on providing mentorship in our lodges. Think about operative masons. What do we have? The entered apprentice. That entered apprentice is mentored by whom? The fellow craft. Who's mentored by whom? The master. I think we all need to double down on our efforts to find those folks who would benefit from our mentoring. Now in the world, according to Russ, there are two kinds of mentorships. There is the intentional mentorship, typically rel related to your career, your profession, your, 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 um, your vocation. And this is typically a younger person who comes up to you and says, you know, David, I admire the job you do and I'd love to learn from you. Will you teach me the ropes? And you take that younger person under your arms and you show them how to do things. And you just are really accelerating their ability and their knowledge versus what they would have to learn on their own or from books. That's the intentional mentorship. The second kind of mentorship is what I call the accidental or incidental mentorship. This is where you don't even realize that you're being an exemplar to somebody. And this is especially particular with the younger generation, be it your children or grandchildren or the Masonic youth orders. You see, children learn far more from what they witness in our actions than anything we can ever tell them. If you want an example of this, if you have a young driver in your house, what have you been telling them for years? Don't ever text and drive. But the minute they get in the car while you're driving and you pick up the phone and answer a text, you have just undone everything you have been telling them. So my admonition here, my caution here is, beware of those unintentional mentorships, the ones that you haven't formalized. And ask yourself, am I exemplifying the type of behavior that I would hope that they would emulate? I'll suggest to you that each of us have room to grow in that area. The symbol isn't quite finished yet, is it? Not until we have the volume of the sacred law surmounting it. We all know that even with all the lessons of circumscribing that circle around our passions and our prejudices, even with the guidance of our patron saints and our Masonic mentors, we still need additional help to be that kind of person we strive to be. And now with that divine guidance, we cannot materially err. Let me tell you a quick story about um, Worshipful Jack Joe of, of Blessed Memory. I became a Master Mason in May of 1992. The Master congratulated me and immediately sat me in the junior steward's chair. Came home, my wife Linda asked how it went and I said, oh, it was really great. And guess what, babe, what's that? I'm gonna be an officer, I am an officer. And as you heard from Worshipful Roberto, um, she grew up in a Masonic house and she said, do you have any idea what that me means? And I said, none. Um, boy, what did I, was I in for it? But from that very night, until I became master a mere three and a half years ago, after every meeting, Worshipful Jack would come up next to me, put his arm around me, and proceed to tell me what I had done wrong. Fast forward to December of 1996, my final and 12th and final meeting is Master of the Lodge. And I finally, after 12 attempts, nailed it. I didn't forget to introduce the masters and past masters. I didn't forget the pledge, the invocation. I nailed it. And I was determined to get out of that lodge room before Jack could catch up to me and ruin my day. So I gavel the lodge closed, I remove my collar, I remove my apron, and I make a beeline for the Tyler's door. Well, for an older guy, Jack was pretty quick because about the time I met up with the altar, there he was puts his arm around me. And I need to tell you, I had my arm cocked. I was ready to give it to him right in the, in the gut. How dare you rain on my parade? Fortunately, something stopped me. And I realized that while I thought I was at the pinnacle of my Masonic career, while I thought I didn't have anything more to learn, Worshipful Jack knew I had a whole lot more to do, to learn, and a whole lot more improvement to do. And he never gave up on me. And I have to tell you, he's been gone now for, I think it's probably eight or nine years. And his advice to me, his, his voice still resonates in me. 
So who are you going to mentor? To whom are you going to be Merciful Jack? All righty. So much of what we can do here isn't a complete transformation of who you are. You are special the way you are. You already are doing such a great job. This is about that incremental improvement that each of us have room to do. Some of it is simply in how we converse with one another. Have you ever been in that conversation with somebody and you tell them something and they say yes, and for that instant second, you're elated. They're agreeing with me. And in a split moment later, they say comma, but. And immediately that, immediately that elation vanishes and you think to yourself, <coughs> pardon me, all subconsciously, of course, oh boy, here it comes. Now they're gonna shoot me down. And a shield, an armor gets erected when they say yes, but. Now they may not be shooting you down, but that's subconsciously how you're hearing it. And when you do that to others, that's how they're hearing it. So a very simple thing that each of us can commit to changing right now is change that yes, but to yes, and. Think about that. Now we're building on the conversation. Yes, Rich, and did you think about this as well? Or we could also do this. Aren't we as Masons supposed to be builders? Let's build on relationships. Let's build on positive interactions and conversations. All right, we've all heard that social media is the bane of our existence and the root of every evil problem that society faces these days. I don't look at it quite that way. To me, social media is a tool, an instrument, not unlike the, the gavel in the hands of the, ma the master. They can be used for great good or greater evil. Not unlike a butcher knife that can be used to prepare your food or actually murder somebody. Think about social media. Have you connected with a long lost friend or family member that but for social media might have remained at that perpetual distance. But we've all been parts of, and we've all witnessed those conversations, even among brother Masons that turn ugly. And that's where we talk about social media being that, that incredibly destructive tool. Those of you that are friends with me on, on Facebook know that I occasionally post something that can be very divisive. And I do that for two primary reasons. One is I'm genuinely interested in hearing from people who think differently about the subject than I do. That's how I'm able to see my blind spots and perhaps see other ways of thinking about it that I'm just not spotting. The other reason I do it is to try to exemplify to others how to have difficult conversations. And, um, show them that I'm not going to get roped into being uncivil, at least to the best of my ability. But one of the things that I've done with what I think is success is when I see a conversation, particularly among Masons, going off the rails, I'll just do hashtag Masons for civility or Demolay or Jobs or Rainbow for civility. And it's doing one of two things. It's either quieting the, the, the conversation, lowering the temperature, or they're unfriending me and taking the conversation elsewhere, frankly, either of which is okay with me. But you might want to try this and see if it works. My theory is that it's a, a somewhat gentle but obvious way to get the message across without coming across too preachy. There's a poet, uh, Harak, uh, Haruki Murakami, who wrote, always remember that to argue and win is to break down the reality of the person against whom you are arguing. It is painful to lose your reality. So be kind, even if you are right. How often do we get into arguments because we need to be right? I may ruffle some feathers here, but I'm gonna to suggest to you that there are actually very few absolute truths in this world. 
Once upon a time, the absolute universal truth was that the world was flat. Okay, I guess there's still some people that feel that way. I'm gonna just go so far as to suggest that even religion is not an absolute truth, but rather a deeply held personal belief that becomes their personal truth. And I say this because I think it can shift our attitudes. If we can realize that, yes, there are some absolute truths, but probably far fewer than we want to believe. And if we can get to the point of agreeing that, you know what, it's a matter of perspective. You know, okay, two plus two is four. Well, really, in certain lines of mathematics, it's 22. Okay. So it's all about that kind of perspective. And what I think we need to, to learn to do is to grant people the grace to back away from the line in the sand that they've drawn. We would want that. I can't tell you how often I learn I'm, I was wrong about something. And that's not an easy thing to fess up to. So I need the person who I was wrong with to allow me the, the grace to say, you know what, I was wrong and, and I'm sorry. And the relationship can then move on in a positive direction. All right, let me share with you the three Ds. Many of you have seen this before. Hopefully it helps to reinforce it. The first D is a debate. Those of you that have been on the debate team know that your sole purpose is to win. And that there are certain cardinal rules that you need to follow. Because if you violate any of them, you will be as good as lost. And among those, the main one is you can never ever waver from your position. Because if you do, you're as good as lost. You know what, Edgar? That's something I never thought about. In fact, you make a really good point. As soon as I say that, I'm lost, okay? I think we can think of times and places where debating is appropriate. I'm gonna to suggest to you that political debates we see on TV are not legitimate debates. Those are made for TV opportunities for the candidates to get in their sound bites. The second D is a deliberation. And this is the methodology under which a lodge is supposed to function. We have a problem, a problem where the solutions are not immediately evident. So we're gonna to gather together the people with the right understanding and expertise and education and experience. And the first thing they're likely to do is deliberate about what the true problem is. Because oftentimes what we identify as the, as the problem isn't the core issue. Next thing they're gonna do is brainstorm possible solutions and discuss the advantages and disadvantages to each. And to the best of their ability, they're gonna to try to identify unintended consequences. And at the end of this deliberation, they're gonna reach a consensus as far as the best course of action to take forward to resolve these problems. Now, does consensus mean that everybody agrees that it's unanimous? No, but it does mean it's a decision that the group will get behind. And when they walk out of that room, they will talk with a united voice. So think of the application of that in your lodges. And think about how, if you have a dissenting opinion, how important it is to give that extra airing. You know, master of the lodge, we want things to go smoothly. We don't want any dissent. We want to get unanimous um, eyes to everything that we're bringing up. But I'll tell you, as I lead different committees or boards, if I get a sense that somebody is not feeling good about the decision we're making in their gut, I'm gonna go out of my way to ask them what's troubling them about it. Ideally, I'm doing this before the vote. And in fact, I'll even ask for a straw vote before I take the official vote. And I cannot tell you how many times that, that, that gut feeling that somebody was able to express because we gave them the space to do so has saved us some real grief. So pay attention to dissent. It's okay. It's valuable. The third D is dialogue. And dialogue in its simplest terms is about speaking and about hearing. It is not about convincing somebody that you're right, like a debate. It is not about finding solutions as is a deliberation. 
gosh, if it's not about winning, if it's not about finding answers, then why waste your time in dialogue? And the simple reason is it's important to not only hear, but to be heard. And when we engage in productive dialogue, we are able to learn, we're able to grow. We're able to see other perspectives. Because no matter how hard you try, there's just no way to see all the other perspectives. Dialogue, as I said, is easy when we're getting along. It's difficult when we disagree with one another. By the way, have you ever been in a conversation with somebody where you just want to take them by the lapel and shake them and say, you are not hearing me? Sometimes we just simply need to be heard. So how do we engage in civil dialogue? when times are difficult, when we are not seeing eye to eye. Well, the Hugh Downs School of Human Communication out of Arizona State University have formed the Institute for Civil Dialogue. And they've developed this um, dialogue exercise that I have found to be very, very effective, not only in large groups, but smaller groups, and frankly, parts of this in one-on-one -on -one conversations. So the way it works is you pose a statement, not a question, but a statement that is designed to get the hair on people's necks up. And you're going to have people that strongly agree and strongly disagree with this and everywhere in between. So as an example, whoops. Um, okay. If uh, outside of a Masonic group, I'll do the, uh, I'll pose the electoral college in its current state should be abandoned. Or inside a Masonic group, I've often done, it would be appropriate for Freemasonry to sponsor a youth order that's open to people of all genders. And as you're reading this, I hope you're thinking, yeah, absolutely, or no way in the world, that would be a disaster. And the way this works is the facilitator shares the statement and then shares some factual information about it, talks about the three youth orders and how they're open to men, uh, boys or girls, and so on. And then talks about how, um, you know, the ages that they're available and so on. And then the, the facilitator will ask people to come and take one of these five seats. Some of that strongly agrees, some of that strongly disagrees. Someone agrees, somewhat disagree. And the neutral or undecided, the Switzerland or the Libra person. And then the facilitator shares certain ground rules. And these again are good whether you're in a group discussion or whether you are in a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Be passionate. As I said earlier, be, without passion, nothing worthwhile would ever be accomplished, but we need to do it without being hostile. And we do that in part by focusing on how the statement makes you feel. When we do that, we don't get uh, accusatory. Use truthful speech that's not attacking speech. And one way we do this is you use I language as opposed to you language. I think, I feel, I believe. It changes the whole context of the conversation when you do that. I'm gonna interrupt myself. Remember I asked you to come up with three things that you were gonna implement. I hope you're coming up with those and writing them down. Disagree, but do it without demonizing the other person. The, the hardest thing for me to do is to engage in active listening. It's really hard and it takes concentrated effort for me to do it. First, you can't interrupt when somebody's talking. You need to be actively listening to them, patiently listening to them. And there's a problem with doing this. If you don't allow your mind to formulate a response while they're talking, you may well forget what they were gonna say. To which I say, maybe that's okay. What you were gonna say wasn't that important after all, or you would have remembered it. But here's the problem with allowing your mind to start to formulate your response. Studies show that much as we wanna think we can multitask, we can't. As soon as we start doing something else, thinking about something else, we shut down. So you're no longer listening when you're allowing yourself to formulate your response. Don't engage in fake listening. Do nod, do acknowledge them, but don't do it in a fake manner. 
something I found that's extremely helpful in my conversations is reframing what I think I heard somebody say. Well, Jim, what I think I heard you say is, and this is doing two things. First, it's letting Jim know that I heard him. But the more important thing perhaps is that it's allowing Jim to correct something that I may have misunderstood. How many knockdown, drag out arguments have you had that have lasted hours or days or even years that you later determined were over a silly misunderstanding? Reframing allows you to identify that early on and not risk losing your relationship. Now, something else that is um, that makes this work is that the facilitator ahead of time identifies an information source in the audience, someone that has good Wi-Fi on their phone. And if somebody on the panel states something as fact that somebody says, you know what, I'm not so sure of that, that line of conversation shuts down until that information source can prove or disprove it. And it's amazing just having that person present, even when they really, if ever get called upon, changes how we talk about things. Instead of saying, well, we all know that 66.25% of all people think this way, we might say something like, well, it's my understanding that most people feel this way. You see that subtlety, but how it changes the conversation. So much of what we need to do is avoid drawing that line in the sand beyond which we can never back away. I hope this is resonating with you. Um, those of you that have been around masonry for a while may have experienced Solomon's Wheel, where we take the three principal tenets, the four cardinal virtues, and on the floor, we use uh, painter's tape and we mask out the spokes of a wheel. And we put these words, phrases in each of them. And if you do this properly, you're gonna have eight spots where we only have seven of these tenets. So one of them is a blank spot. Um, I wish I could see a show of hands how many people have done this. It's incredibly powerful, especially with a group of people. And the first part of it is you have the folks come and actually stand in each of these wedges and contemplate what that is meaning to them. And you have them walk the circle. You have a bunch of them, make sure they're walking the same direction so they're not walking into each other. And then you ask them to go and stand in the section that's particularly speaking to them at this time. Next step is to have those that are in that slice act out what that means without using words. And the benefit of doing this is we can all recite the Webster's Dictionary ver, uh, definition of it, but acting it out internalizes it more. By the way, when we do this exercise, we need to ask everybody to commit to keeping what's said in here only in here and not sharing it, because we've seen people get extremely emotional with this next step. And that is going to the wedge where you feel you need the most help at this time. And I've had people run over and hug the other, another person. I've had people apologize to each other. It's really, really powerful. So let me share with you how I use this tool to this day. I have a picture of it on my desk. And when I'm encountering a different, difficult solution where the solution is not immediately evident to me, I close my eyes and I mentally walk Solomon's wheel. And I probably take anywhere from 30 minutes to a couple, uh, 30 seconds to a couple minutes doing it. And I just think about what each of these tenets is saying to me at that time. And I find the, uh, the answer usually becomes pretty clear to me in doing that. By the way, um, I try to force myself when I face a dilemma to after I've made the decision and, and implemented it, to force myself to stand back and and grade myself, if you will, on the decision I made. And if I made a decision of which I am ultimately proud, I then ask myself, was I able to do that because of my upbringing from my parents, because of my religious training, or because of Freemasonry? And the answer I inevitably come to is that it is a combination of those three things. You see, it's my belief that if we only rely on one set of influences, we're not gonna be that whole person and we're not gonna be the person we strive to be. So it takes all of these influences, positive influences to shape us into that, that person. 
What do you think of this logo? This was designed by Brother Wilson Bennett of Vancouver, Washington. And I think it just says it all. It's every time I see it, I'm in awe of it. I mentioned that these efforts started um, some seven years ago. They are now under the Worldwide Civility Council. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. I'm gonna run through all of these. Um, one of them that I need to add that I haven't yet is our Civility Ambassador Program. In fact, I, Rich Fonseca is still with us. He's helping to head that effort up for us. The Masonic Family Civility Project. This is a repository of everything that we've created. If you go to masoniccivility.org, you're going to find a presentation such as this. You'll find presentations for Rotary and other service groups, um, schools, your community, what have you. And I encourage you to, to go through and investigate these things. None of them are password protected. They're designed for you to take down uh, and modify to suit your needs, change slides, delete slides, whatever you want. The idea here is that we get the word out. So please note masoniccivility.org and go there frequently. One of the things that we developed early on that we are just in the process of completing a complete re reboot of is the civility scorecard. The idea here is that this you can take a speech and paste it in there and it'll rate the relative level of security um, using artificial intelligence. So it's subjective, not objective. And the idea is to encourage people, particularly politicians, to speak to one another and to us in a dignified manner so we can learn what they actually intend to do to us and for us instead of just blasting one another. Um, the changes we're making now are that it's going to be available in just about real time. So it'll take an audio speech and convert it. And it's also going to have the means of taking your speech and showing you green where that's particularly civil, red where it's particularly uncivil, and ye yellow where you may have an opportunity to improve upon it. Um, great for masters of the lodge, grandmasters, and so on. We developed the Civility Shop with some really cool swag. So I'd encourage you to go to civilityshop.org and uh, help us spread the word that way. And the um, proceeds, the, the net proceeds go to help our efforts in a big way. We held our first Urgency of Civility Conference in the George Washington Masonic Memorial in 2019. Um, we held our last one completely virtual uh, this past May. And we're going to hold another one, ideally entirely in person, or maybe a hybrid in, in 2023, May of 2023. So you can start to get that on your calendar. Out of our first conference came the idea behind Certified Civil. If you're familiar with the Good Housekeeping Seal of Approval, or Underwriter Laboratories indicating an electric piece of electronics is safe to use, similar concept here where an organization, a Masonic Lodge, a business, um, whatever, can apply to be certified civil. And what that means is basically they agree to abide by certain standards of civility. And more importantly, if anybody with whom they're, they're dealing feels like they didn't treat them in that dignified manner, then that person can file what's called a civility concern, not a complaint, but a concern. And when that happens, uh, my law firm, for example, is certified civil. So if one of my clients, one of my coworkers, one of my suppliers thinks I didn't treat them properly, they can file that concern with the Worldwide Civility Council. And they'll speak with the, the client or whomever it is, learn more about the issue. And then they'll come to Russ and they'll say, you know, look, this is how Jane interpreted this. And here are some ways that you can improve that relationship. We think that this is going to have a, a much more grassroots effort uh, impact to create an accountability and an awareness of how we should be treating one another. My dream is that a few years from now, Mark Zuckerberg is testifying yet again in front of Congress and saying, yes, yes, I know we still have problems. But look, we brought in this one group and 35% of our people are now certified civil and it's lowered the temperature immensely. That's the point I'd like to get to. All right, so what are our next steps? The first one is to take 
an internal look. Examine your own behavior because each of us have opportunity to be more civil in every aspect of our lives. You can imagine me you know, being unofficially known as Mr. Civility. There are people just waiting to pounce on me when I blow it, and I do blow it. The key then is that I learn from it and try not to make that same mistake again, but go make new mistakes. And, and by the way, when I blow it and I've hurt somebody, it's my job to do all I can to repair that relationship. We do that, of course, by first apologizing. And there's an art to apologizing, not I'm sorry you interpreted it that way, but I'm sorry my actions hurt you in this manner. I'm Jewish, we're coming up to the high holy days. Yom Kippur is the day of atonement and we are taught to embrace the concept of teshuva during that time. And teshuva literally means to return. And what it teaches us is that when we hurt somebody, it is not enough just to apologize, but we then need to go the next steps to figure out what we can do to repair the relationship, to return it back to the healthy state it was in. So I encourage you all, look inside, look for those opportunities. If you've hurt somebody, find a way to make it right to them. I'm gonna give you a quick example of this. My lodge had consolidated with another lodge this is many years ago. And Worshipful Dave, um, past master from the prior lodge, he just came across, he's loud, he's brusque. And I immediately judged this guy to be an absolute jerk. After several meetings um, around him where I held on firmly to that judgment, I um, saw him dealing with another brother in the most compassionate, empathetic way. And I felt like an absolute jerk. I mean, I totally misjudged this man. And I can tell you exactly where I was on the 101. I dialed him up. I said, worship for Dave, I owe you an apology. What, my brother, you ain't done, none, done me no wrong. I said, oh, I most certainly did. Well, what'd you do? I don't know about it. I said, I judged you and I judged you wrongly. And for that, I'm profoundly sorry. And I have to tell you, our relationship now is like that. I consider him to be one of my better friends in masonry. I encourage you to go to masoniccivility.org for those resources. Look for opportunities to promote this concept, not only in your lodge, but in your community. Look to becoming a, a civility ambassador. You can either email us, info at masoniccivility.org, contact Rich, lots of ways to get a hold of us. And we're looking to really reboot this effort. We do have civility ambassadors across the globe. We have them in, in all across Canada, Mexico, Serbia, um, Israel, all across the globe. You can support us by um, making a donation to the Worldwide Civility Council or by going to civilityshop.org. Pencil in May of 2023. We'll get um, actual dates to as soon as we pin them in. Um, we have two things that you can subscribe to. We have a podcast. Just Google Worldwide Civility and you'll find it. We have a YouTube channel. And I'm hoping we can get this broadcast onto both of those. And believe it or not, October 20th isn't too far away. Um, all of you, most of you know, uh, very worshipful Jack Rose, our former grand lecturer. He came to me one day with, one day with this idea of celebrating a day without politics. Well, what do you have in mind? He says, well, my son and I were talking and it took no time at all for the conversation to devolve into politics. And my son, Trevor said, you know, Dad, can't we just have a day without talking politics? And Jack said, well, yeah, sure. What do you suggest? He says, well, my birthday is October 20th. How about October 20th? Um, so we've observed that now. I think it's three years. First year was really easy because it was a Grand Lodge day. Um, but it, it's not as easy as you might think. But it's kind of a, a mental uh, sorbet, a, a cleansing of the mind, if you will. All right, here's my cheap, shameless plug. Um, I am finally finished with the book, The Civility Mosaic, How Anyone Can Use the Principles of Freemasonry to Repair Our World. Um, in fact, I just got the final edits off, and it should be in publication within a matter of weeks. Um, it'll be available through McCoy's. We'll publicize it through um, the Grand Lodge and so on. 
but this is taking a lot of what I've shared with you this evening and put it into a book form where you can spend a little more time with it, become more of a student of it. Um, to me, this is appropriate not only for the Mason, but for what I call the Masonic curious, but also the person who doesn't give a hoot about masonry, but just wants to know how they can do more to restore civility in society. What I've also done with this book is I've designed after each chapter an exercise. You can either QR code it on your phone or your tablet, do it on your computer, or if you're one of those that likes to write in a book, there's space for you to do it. And you'll answer each of these or, or fulfill each of these exercises and it'll take you along a Masonic journey. So I hope you look forward to that and it will turn this cartoon into a, a, a past, the long past, because right now it is saying it all, civility or else. My brother, what I hope you're getting out of tonight is that incivility is just going to happen. It's the path of least resistance. It's the track that water will find. Restoring civility is gonna take effort. It's gonna take deliberate concentration. But we can do this using the Masonic values, using the words, the tools, the symbols. We have exactly what it takes to be that proverbial stone and allow ourselves to be dropped into the placid waters of complacency and now allow our actions, our words, our behaviors to spread to the far shores and bring about change and begin to repair our world. I thank you all very much for the time. All of my contact information is there, so don't hesitate to reach out to me. And with permission of the Worshipful Master, I would love to entertain any questions anybody might have. Thank you, most worshipful, Russ. What I don't want to know is how many I put to sleep. <laughs> I don't believe anybody uh, who's attending uh, your presentation. Great presentation. It's always a pleasure to uh, be a part of your orations. Um, we do have probably a few questions. Uh, just remind the brethren, uh, call your attention to the bottom of your screen. If you wish to direct a question to our speaker, you can either click on the chat box and submit it, or you can click on the Q&A button and ask the question directly. Um, Worshipful Marty. Uh, Brother yeah, a, uh, Worshipful, I'll, I'll pop in here uh, and just reminding again, people, uh, you can also hit that raise hand button if you want to ask it out loud. Um, and most worshipful, Russ, I believe that your slideshow had cut out uh, within the first 15 minutes. Uh, oh, no. If, yeah, if you don't mind, if you can email that over to me, I will insert that into the video. Uh, so those that miss the slides, um, you can watch those again, uh, or I can share your slides directly with anybody that uh, would like to see that. Um, but I, I do have... I wish somebody had spoken up. Well, you were on such a great roll. You you had us all enthralled by what you were talking about. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, even though we didn't have any vis visible res representation of what you were speaking about. But it was it was excellent. So uh, this first question, um, I want to bring this concept back to our lodge. How do we begin the process of creating a working definition of civility within our own lodge? Great question. I think I would start by asking the brethren not to define the word civility, but how they would expect to be dealt with by their brother Mason and how they wish to deal with them. And I think as you get the definition around that, you will have in fact defined the word civility. Great. Um, by the way, I did put my presentation in the chat so anybody that's on the computer can download it. And I'm terribly sorry about that, brother. I, I was in full screen, so I wasn't able to see it. No problem at all. I think brother Aiden has uh, another question that he fielded. One moment. Uh, chat. Yes, here's a question, um, most worshipful. 
In your discourse with junior orders, do you see significant hope that they will promote civility as they progress in masonry and in life? My goodness, I absolutely do. Um, that's what keeps this, my efforts going. Um, in fact, I'll go so far as to say, I think we um, old farts ought to turn the keys of the world over to the younger generation now because they get it um, and they want to improve themselves. They want to repair the world. And I'm gonna go so far as to suggest if you have a young person in your life, be it a son or daughter, or grandchild, um, niece or nephew, somebody you know in your workplace, invite them to learn more about our Masonic Youth Orders. That is what society needs right now. And our youth orders are delivering in a big way. And I have to tell you, they have embraced this message um, in just such a beautiful, amazing way. So absolutely. Um, most worshipful, the next question is um, the term civility, uh, as you illustrated uh, with the Wikipedia page, uh, is a somewhat uh, newly created concept. Why was it not expressly included in our Blue Lodge California uh, masonry ritual? And would it have helped lodges function if it was included? I'm going to answer that in two ways. On one hand, I think it is through and through each of our three degrees. I think it's in our opening and our closing of lodge. And practice out of the lodge, those great moral duties that are inculcated in it. And if you listen to our installation ceremony, it's woven throughout there um, in, in just really beautiful ways. But Freemasonry doesn't spoon feed this to us. That's the beauty of it. I, I, I'm gonna answer this by giving you another quick story. Most of you know most worshipful John Cooper, grandmaster who preceded me. He and I were in a, a, a degree, first degree at Columbia Lodge up in uh, Columbia National Park, uh, State Park. And uh, in the middle of the degree, we're on the sidelines and he pokes me and I'm thinking, oh gosh, I fell asleep or something. And he said, did you catch that? Did you catch that? And I said, yeah, he delivered it really well. He says, no, no, no. And he said, it's coming later. You're disturbing the meeting. And we get out there and he had, I mean, worse, most worse of John had conferred hundreds, if not thousands of degrees. He'd sat in thousands of them. And yet here he was, a 50 year Mason. The ritual didn't change, hopefully. He changed. He was now more open to it and he was seeing something brand new. That's the beauty of masonry, brethren. So it is there in, in, in our degrees, in, in our ritual. Um, I don't know how many of you have read the legislation for this annual communication, but you'll see a new piece, the only new piece of legislation. And it's something that I put forth. And it's something that I had observed in other jurisdictions. Now, some of these jurisdictions, such as many in Canada, do this when they present the candidate with his apron. Others do it at the opening of the lodge, which is what I'm pr proposing. And that is the master suggesting that if any brother has a quarrel with any other brother, they retire from the lodge and attempt to work it out rather than to disturb the peace and harmony inside the lodge room. And um, I've talked to many people where they've seen two brothers get up and walk out. And both of them or one of them come back or never come back. But I think it just gets us into that right mindset to engage in the solemn business of masonry. So I hope I answered your question. I know I took that down a couple of rabbit trails. Most worshipful, uh, another question from one of our brothers. I love the image you opened with, repair the world. May I ask, what are the three nuggets that you use every day in your effort to practice civility in your daily life? Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, that it is my fundamental duty to leave this world in better shape than I found it the day I was born. Um, and if I have that guiding principle, um, look, there are days I mess it up, okay? <laughs> Um, but for the most part, hopefully I'm making a little bit of difference each and every day. Um, that this, you know, that's the, a huge global undertaking and can be daunting and you can say, I'll never get there, so I'll forget it. So then I try to bite size it. And that is just changing little bits of my behavior. 
Um, I'll tell you, I used to be one of those real aggressive drivers. You know, I'm Southern California, you're, nor you're Northern California. You have far worse traffic up there than we do down here. What are the four things we don't talk about in a lodge? Religion, politics, baseball, or traffic, right? Because you have that lousy baseball team up there too. Um, but back to this. Um, I was, a lousy, I was a, an aggressive driver. And it just, as I started getting into this effort, I realized, look, honking at that clown, giving him that special salute, going and cutting him off because he cut me off. All that's doing is putting my life and others in, in danger. It's raising my, my blood pressure on unhealthy levels. I'm now going and making 10 other lives miserable. And so I just, I recognize it's gonna happen. So I shake it off. By the same token, I will tell you, there are some people with whom I will not engage. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, Most Worshipful Dave Perry, the Grand Master who followed me, you may recall, we had this incident where Texas and Georgia were effectively banning gay members. And he tried to engage the Grand Master of Georgia in a conversation about it. And not far into the conversation, the Grand Master of Georgia said, you know what? I will never be seen sitting in a lodge with a black man. And Dave handled it exactly the way I think I would have handled it. He said, my brother, I do not respect you for that. This conversation's over. Okay. You know, you've got to choose where and when to engage. And then it's a question of how to engage. So brother Aiden, I think it's about thinking globally, like I started with, and then finding those couple of things that you can try to implement and live day in and day out that will translate to being the kind of person you strive to be. Well, most worshipful, it looks like we are just about um, out of time. Uh, before I hand it back to our uh, worshipful master uh, for the outro, I just want to uh, remind everybody that in the chat, most worshipful Russ uh, did put the link to his book, uh, but I will also email that to all the participants um, and the video should be available in the next one or two days uh, video recording. You're welcome to share that with any member uh, or um, a brother or friend that you may know that may be interested in this particular topic. Um, well, that's all for me. I will pass it back to our Worshipful Master, uh, Worshipful Roberto Diaz. Thank you, Worshipful. Thank you again, Most Worshipful Russ, uh, for agreeing to be here this evening and presenting us with such a timely and relevant topic. Uh, these are indeed historical times for us, not, not only locally, but worldwide. And now more than ever, Freemasonry uh, teachings are not only relevant, but are so needed. Uh, before we retire this evening, gentlemen, I would like to give special thanks uh, for all the help and support to our team, which made this evening's presentation possible. Worshipful brother uh, Marty Cousy and brothers uh, Dennis Silva and uh, Aiden Cotter. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, for a job well done. Also, thank you uh, to Brother Barry Kopp that uh, was a, a participant virtually, but uh, is, I believe has logged out. But uh, thank you for arranging this uh, presentation tonight. Brother, thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, we look forward to having you again for future speaker presentations, um, a fly with future presentations and instructions on how to register will be forthcoming. So brethren, stay well, please stay safe. Have a great evening before we depart. Uh, Brother Chaplin, if you could. Supreme Grand Master, ruler of heaven and earth. Now that we are about to separate and return to our respective places of abode, wilt thou be so pleased to influence our hearts and minds that we may each one of us practice out of the lodge the great moral duties which are inculcated in it. And with reverence, study and obey the laws which thou hast given us in thy holy word. Amen. Thank you. Thank you all. And a very good night, my brothers. Thank you, Worshipful.